Hello and uh, good evening. Um, I'm not uh, Zigrid Karg, although I'll be introducing her shortly. Uh, I'm Dan Plesch and I'm the Director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy uh, here at SOAS. Uh, we're delighted uh, that Zigrid Karg has agreed to be with us this evening to uh, speak on a rather long title of her experience in multilateralism in the Middle East from the chemical weapons elimination program in Syria to UN engagement in the Lebanon. I want to say a word or two about the centre and about uh, why I'm particularly pleased to have her here speaking on this topic at the centre. Uh, we, on the teaching side, uh, have half a dozen different uh, programmes and some 330 uh, master students. Um, I'm distraught that having looked at uh, our speaker's uh, biography, uh, she's taken master's degrees, I think, at most every other university in England apart from SOAS, but we had to forgive her for that. Um, I think she said she had a place here but went to Oxford instead, um, which I guess we have to forgive her for. Um, so if you have anybody contemplating uh, a further study or indeed research, then uh, encourage them to think of us. And if you are a bachelor, uh, studying for a bachelor's at SOAS, also uh, think of us. I came to this role about seven years ago, having worked uh, both as a commentator on the evolving uh, war on terror and then subsequently the war in Iraq. And one of the things which I was encouraged to do by old colleagues who said, well, have you forgotten your interest in arms control and disarmament, was to begin a number of um, public and private discussions on weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East, uh, which bore small and unfulfilled um, fruit, or un un probably un ungrown fruit, in the form of a resolution of the UN to hold a conference on making the Middle East free of WMD. And as part of our research, we also sought to think, well, if we are going to get back into the disarmament business as a whole, might one think about what is the best practice from the past? And that brought us to the scrap project, the leaflets for which you'll find outside, and which I will not talk about more this evening. Safe to say that as we saw the uh, period of crisis around Syria a couple of years ago, that there emerged, and we'll perhaps hear more about this, um, on the eve of uh, very strong domestic pressure for the United States to uh, take military action in Syria, uh, there suddenly um, there emerged a treaty of which almost no one had heard, the Chemical Weapons Convention, a, a treaty, one of which a great many people, uh, certainly in the international relations academic community, regarded as one of a uh, a batch of treaties that were s agreed during the end of the period around the end of the Cold War and negotiated to no very good purpose uh, except to uh, consign the Soviet Union to the dustbin and could easily be forgotten once and for all. And yet it was this treaty and uh, at least some of its provisions which um, arguably stopped a necessary war, arguably stopped a dangerous and unnecessary one from getting uh, even further out of hand. Uh, so, um, when through one of our research uh, associates, Richard Arcuck, we discovered we had a connection um, to uh, a person in the middle of all of that. It seemed um, a very good idea to invite her to come and speak. But, uh, of course, this evening she will be speaking about her uh, work and experience in general in the Middle East, rather than specifically about that particular aspect of it, although I'm sure she will respond to, to questions. Um, and of course, her experience in the region is extremely considerable. Uh, she is currently the special coordinator uh, for the United Nations in the Lebanon. Uh, she has worked in senior positions for UNDP, for UNICEF, and in Palestine uh, in a career of some 20 years in the UN, prior to which she worked both for the Dutch Ministry of the Foreign Affairs uh, and for Shell, 
So I hope you will uh, join me in giving uh, Ms. Carg a very warm welcome and inviting her to address us here this evening. Thank you. I have Dan's notes here, but I think I'll have to look for my own. Great. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm delighted you're actually all here. I know it's a fairly warm spring going into summer evening in the UK and in London, so I'm very impressed. Uh, I would like to, first of all, acknowledge my predecessor, a special coordinator in Lebanon, Sir Derek Plumley. I'm delighted he's taken the time, and I'm very happy to be here to discuss with you because I've structured my notes in a way as a contribution to a discussion with you. I hope an interaction. I'm aware that some of you are experts in the field, be it of diplomacy, international affairs, or the Middle East. So I also hope to learn from you. Um, the United, Na United Kingdom, of course, has a particular relationship, a long historical uh, tie that binds itself to the Middle East, ranging from the echoes of Lawrence of Arabia, Sykes-Picot, and of course also the Balfour Declaration. These echoes are still being heard, we feel them, and the repercussions are also still amongst us. So what's happening in the Middle East today has an impact, has an effect on the United Kingdom, but also wider Europe. The clear examples we see today, of course, are the UK citizens who are fighting to join ISIS or other extremist groups. The, spears, the other side of the coin is, of course, the crisis in the Mediterranean, which may be from the UK across the channel you don't acutely feel, but I think it's a European dilemma and a European dimension, and it's a humanitarian and human responsibility. I will speak today not on Syria chemical weapons, but I will gladly answer any questions you have, criticism you want to voice on this. I want to speak on the region in three different aspects, but my premise is that a number of the crises we see in their profoundest forms are the absence over decades of citizenship, human rights, inclusive governance, and a failure collectively by the international community to seize different opportunities. I also want to speak to the importance of engagement, but the fact that engagement is complex and going after the symptoms may be important, but it will not address the fundamental root causes of many of the situations we see today in the region. However, coming from the UN, and I'm speaking in my personal capacity, hopefully drawing on experience, I also want to point to a number of roles and aspects the UN can lead on or ought to lead on, and I believe we are also working on that. But let's start, if we just look back a few years ago, I want to go back to the famous so-called, so-called, because it was more of a Western label, Arab Spring. And we now know when we take stock, we're really looking at an Arab winter. We looked at a quest as an eruption of opportunities, voices, youth who took to the street to really look for proper democracy, not just elections, stilted elections, but stolen elections, but proper forms of de democratic process, freedom of expression, economic reform, and above all, equity for all the citizens. And as I mentioned before, the notion of citizenship has been severely lacking. How did we end up so quickly from a period of a struggle to end oppression, systemic oppression, to a very short period of hope, maybe overrated hope, maybe we read too much into it, to continued and new entrenched movements which also produced further forms of radicalization? As I just mentioned, I think the backdrop to the present trajectory in the Middle East is the widespread absence of full and enjoyed civic rights, continuous human rights violations, resentment and dissatisfaction over the way the question of Palestine has been handled over decades, but also coupled with deep economic and socio-economic resentment. I want to take you back to two particular reports that UNDP produced in 2004 and 2009. Uh, the statistics and the analysis in there are very interesting. It talked already then, and Arab, Arab intellectuals have done so over decades as well, about the shortcomings in the achievement of political rights, women's rights, the absence of inclusive governance in a context of worsening employment opportunities for the overall population of the region and growing economic pressures with no place to go. And in this context, you also have to be very mindful that the Middle East is the, the, the region where we speak of a so-called youth bulge. Youth is basically the majority in some countries of the population. If you look at the age group, six to 24, if you look at children up to 18, 
but the youth bulge has contributed to increased unemployment in skilled and unskilled workers. You will also know the education attainment rates in the region have been quite high if you take the LDCs out of the equation, the middle income countries, but also countries such as Egypt and others, those who manage to go into school, do primary education, secondary education, there is a, there is a, a constant stream of university graduates who aspire something to fight them their way out of the, of the family or the, the, the socioeconomic level they were born into to achieve something. But there is no opportunity. In Lebanon, for instance, unemployment stands at 24%, but youth unemployment at over 35%. These are extraordinarily high statistics with no change in the economy and certainly not an approach to create meaningful employment for youth. Women's employment, of course, and unemployment, rather, stands at a staggering high 20% in the MENA region. If you take it country by country, you'll see the statistics even more diverse and negative for women, be they skilled, be they highly educated, or be they less educated. Women's employment is primarily in the informal sector rather than the formal sector. And if you look at the economy, in most countries you know that it's been very state-driven, public sector, but no growth and certainly no economic dividends that can be redistributed if we're looking at equity. This is the context. Now, if we're looking at conflict, if we look at recent years, both the crisis in Syria and, of course, Iraq predates that. They were triggered in different settings, on different occasions. But above all, the takeaway, again, is the absence of viable, citizen-focused policy responses to the conditions of the people the state is supposed to serve. The steady deterioration of situations has resulted now, if we look just at the Levant alone, Syria and Iraq in particular, at failing or near disappearing state structures, a proliferation of non-state actors of extremist nature, alongside the expansion and establishment or consolidation of power and access by sectarian militias. And in Iraq, you've seen this if you've also followed the news in the last uh, two years. But also a deepened proxy warfare amongst the major powers, so we had a brief Arab Spring, descended quickly into an Arab winter, lack of opportunities, we have failing state structures, and we have disappearing state structures. Over and above these challenges, we are now confronted, all of us, I think, and we see this in Europe, with asymmetrical warfare, the state against its citizens, but also trans transnational conflicts which have taken hold. And this is fairly new for a region where the Arab state was emerging, where Arab identity was, it was, there was the aim to establish an Arab identity, suddenly we see something quite different. And our traditional policy instruments, particularly for those of you who aspire to work in international affairs, the toolkit we have to date just doesn't serve. It doesn't take us far enough. We're working in a system where it's member state to member state. It is a rule of law applied by the member state or the state, and increasingly so the actors are non-state actors. They have an appeal to individuals further afield beyond the borders of the, of the countries or the geographical settings where the crisis takes place. We have a divided Security Council more than ever before, and we have an, an absence of an integrated approach to deal with the complexity of the problems we face today. Very often the temptation is to go after the military or the security component, as we also see in the battle against ISIS. My premise is, and I think that is quite clear, it's not rocket science, this won't suffice. It certainly won't suffice when we're looking at the victims. In Syria alone, we're looking at well over 225,000 innocent people, victims, um, and one million injured or maimed, with very little chance of rehabilitation or a return to normalcy. The corollary damage of all these types of conflicts is a tremendous human toll. Not just the present, it is also the future. It, it, we, we often now speak, when it comes to Syria, of lost generation of Syrian children, of Syrian youth. The prospects of a nation have truly transformed into a very bleak one. The price of our inaction is also a loss of the international community's credibility and reputation, and I will come back to that. If the Arab uprisings, or rather particularly in Syria and other places, were about emancipation and empowerment, we're talking about unmet expectations, selective support from the international community, and truly a lack of options to channel the discontent. And new forms of resentment quite easily emerge. And I think the quick answer, of course, is 
partly to that the radicalization. However, my premise is that radical movements did not appear overnight. This is why I started with the overall setting of discontentment and oppression and absence of rights. They've, however, transmorphed themselves and they have radicalized and become more extreme and are monopolizing the use of violence prior always only in the hands of the state. So the nature of opposition has changed significantly, which has also made our response significantly different. We're now faced with gross violations of human rights and international humanitarian law by a plethora of actors. If any of you follow, particularly the beginning of the Syria crisis, if you looked at the different opposition groups from moderate opposition to the more extremist ones, the numbers and the types of groups that over a period of time emerged from locality to locality, alliances, tactical, more strategic, the shifts that were taking place, it was very difficult to know not only who is who, but who is reliable enough to maybe have a dialogue with and have a conversation with when you look at access, let alone a, a political solution to the crisis. But in the absence of directed international engagement against clear policy objectives, and I think this is extremely important, radical forces have been set free and there's a gravitational pull by, by actors such as ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra for the disenfranchised. If everything else, or if you feel everybody else has failed you and you're under threat, and as the conflict continues, um, those looking for meaning in conflict may just feel themselves or find themselves compelled to join. And last but not least, because the financial incentives, be they very short-lived, are also part of it. If you're starving in Raqqa, you may in the end actually decide to join in the absence of anything to give meaning to your existence where you are. But I want to state that from my personal perspective, and I would gladly hear from the audience, I, I, don't, I don't go with the notion that it is all about sectarian strife. I think this is fairly new. Uh, in the absence, however, of, of options, the most marginalized will go to a new form of identity or channel. This is quite normal. Europe tends to retrench too. If the citizen feels alienated, let's say, from Brussels, suddenly you find that you discover your old province or your old language. To go to a level of your identity doesn't mean that you work and think in sectarian forms. There is a, a political drive, there is an interest by a number of actors to present it in this way. But to my mind, citizens over, over the history of the Middle East have not necessarily organized themselves. The region has been known for its coexistence, for its tolerance, and the ability to have very heterogeneous societies, more actually potentially than Europe has witnessed in its own history. We've however come at a breaking point, and it's so important therefore that we offer alternatives and we take the region back to what is, what is meaningful civic engagement. Of course, in the region, we're also looking at shifts and changes, and these are both opportunities and significant risks. On the one hand, if you look at Libya, you look a little bit further afield, the number or the risks of the, the rise in number of potentially failed or failing states, and I refer to Libya, is very real. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia has taken on a new role as, as a regional ascending power um, with, uh, with the obviously limitations on its ability, but also limitations on its, uh, on its own domestic track record on other key issues. Equally so, the Iran nuclear deal may open a new opportunity and a window. Uh, the jury is out, as we know, whether an Iran post the nuclear deal means that uh, there is a broader a dialogue on a broader range of topics, uh, or rather whether this means that Iran will have access if sanctions are lifted to greater uh, funding and support, and therefore its influence will be exercised differently. This is, I think, a matter for debate and analysis, and the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. This means, however, also that actors, and actors such as Hezbollah, uh, particularly active in Lebanon, but now also in Syria, as you know, very early on, uh, reports of Hezbollah uh, assistance, both in Iraq, but also Yemen. These are only reports. It means that a number of, re of other entities that prior worked only on a given agenda for Hezbollah, this was very much its resistance against Israel, uh, are now also looking or continuing to maintain their engagement in the region beyond the borders of Lebanon. These creates, all these factors create new scenarios for a region if we look at it through a peace and security lens. 
that means new uncertainties about the rules of the game. It also means that more and more that we're dealing, what I mentioned, with an identification of transnational conflict with actors who go beyond their borders and asymmetrical engagement coupled with asymmetrical engagement in conflict. From our side and the UN and the international community, the message is always clear. Any actor needs to avoid any risk, any action that could lead to escalation, but also we call on all actors to disengage from those countries where they should not be. Uh, in this case, uh, Hezbollah's role in Syria, of course, the Secretary General has spoken as the Security Council on consistent occasions. But all in all, I'm painting this picture to show the volatility of a region which a few years ago may have seemed stable. Your average tourist would have happily traveled to many countries. It may have seemed stable, but it was probably a very fragile stability because peace, security, stability can never be built, can never be consolidated if the citizens' rights are not respected and equity is not realized for all of the people in the country. And we have seen that. Now, with proxy battles in space, uh, in, 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 in the region, there's also a new hope, I think, for regional diplomacy. That's why I mentioned Iran and possible changes, the role of Saudi Arabia, its engagement. So not everything is bleak. It is always the choices one makes, which comes back to my point on engagement, engagement, engagement. There is no solution to any conflict other than through political dialogue, through smart diplomacy, through talking to all actors, and this is a unique place we have as the UN, of course, we talk to everybody except those who are on a Security Council list uh, na named as, uh, as terrorist actors. But other than that, we speak and engage with everybody, be it through humanitarian assistance, through our development interventions, but also on the political track through the good offices of the Secretary General. But if we look back at where the region is now, beyond the politics, we're dealing with the largest displacement, human displacement crisis that we have ever seen in the region. 14 million people alone have been displaced over time, and the impact of displacement is very real due to the interlinked crisis in Syria and Iraq. The number of Syrian refugees registered in Lebanon alone would be the equivalent, I'm sorry, I don't have a UK statistic to bring it home, but to 22 and a half million people coming to Germany or 88 million uh, arriving in the US. So obviously the call for burden sharing coming out of the region is very real. And in this context, and those of you who've worked on humanitarian issues know that as always, women and children bear the brunt in any conflict situation, also in displacement. We see and we observe and we note and we express concern about the, about the rise of dangerous coping mechanisms from survival sex for young women and actually women of any age, young girls, child labor, uh, the children being withdrawn from school for either security risks, uh, the, the, the sheer cost of school access. All in all, the statistics are very, very bleak. This also means we erode the capacity of a society. We, uh, this is a frontal attack on anyone's human dignity, and the most vulnerable here are most at risk. The quality of life for those affected by the Syria conflict, but also in Iraq, is quite dismal. Uh, the, the millions that rely on limited and almost minimal basic food assistance is almost, uh, uh, almost too hard to keep up. It's hard to sustain. And we have 600,000 refugee children between Syria and Iraq or the re uh, neighboring countries that are not in school. You can only imagine if from a Western perspective we look at the risk of an extremist attack or a terror attack, anyone, a percentage of 600,000 people that would have had a future under different circumstances but are now not in school, they are very vulnerable, they are future at risk, they are also prey to anyone for manipulation and, uh, and, 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 and incentivization. Because if life has no meaning, if you have no prospects, uh, death may actually become equally compelling. This also means that the impact on Europe is very real. Uh, whilst we talk about um, the, the countries themselves, about Lebanon or Jordan, or we talk about Syria and Iraq as the, the crisis-affected countries, we can and must do significantly better. The uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights writes about this, speaks about this, uh, but you, we just know from the recent statistics that just since January, 15,000 people have attempted to cross the Mediterranean. These are all desperate people that are willing to risk it all for the chance 
not the li real likelihood, but the chance to maybe arrive and the chance to build a better life. About 18 or 1900 people have died already in this process. And naval missions are important, border control is important, it is relevant. However, in the absence of an integrated approach, you will not stop people. Not only do we not address the root causes of the problem, people will always risk it. In the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, for instance, they speak of the Sufan al Mot, the death boats. A lot of people are so desperate, they're happy to chance it. And I think if we were in their shoes, we may do the same. So what do we do? What do we do if we think this is not a sustainable situation, the largest displacement crisis, violations of human rights, not yet a political process that has been taking off, but there are significant efforts uh, to take it forward. What can we do as an international community? Now, there are many scenarios, as you know, that emerge. In recent days and weeks, there is talk of future options around Syria. I think most importantly is to, to await the findings of my colleague Stefan de Mistura, who was in Geneva to talk with all the parties and beyond that, with civil society groups, with women representatives, with the diaspora, uh, with representatives from within Syria. But above all, whichever outcome there is for Syria, the political process is primordial and we must equally be mindful of any future geographical divide to Syria or in Syria that not every scenario is an outcome that one wishes. The only one that we can aim for is a political solution which will allow Syrian citizens and their descendants to go home, to return where they want to be, and to rebuild their lives in dignity, with a, within properly governed structures, with access to services, but also the ability to express themselves. Anything that is short-termish will not be sustainable. And I think you just have to look at other crisis situations where this has been tried, it miserably fails and actually creates another chain and cycle of violence. In this, in this context, we need parallel and sequential efforts. That means humanitarian needs need to be met. We need to look at early recovery where we can, but we need to drive home the need of a political solution. That involves all regional actors and players. That also involves the international community and particularly the Security Council, but also the international financial community. Any hope of rebuilding Syria post this crisis will need a significant and large scale approach, a Marshall Plan which will look at Iraq, which will look at Syria, but will also look at the needs of the neighboring countries which have become increasingly fragile because of the sheer coping mechanism, the need to cope with the presence of a large refugee population and the fragility that the presence of extremist groups have created. I, we're, of course, always reminded, and particularly in the UN, that there's always donor fatigue. There's also political fatigue. Nobody likes a crisis that looks quite intractable, quite difficult to solve, whilst there are many other situations. We notice it even in Lebanon, uh, when we looked at uh, the, the very sad earthquake which occurred in Nepal. Suddenly, everybody was busy with that, as if there weren't a, num you know, a thousand people dying in Syria that week. For me, every human life is that is sacred. It's not whether you die in Nepal or in Syria. We owe it to everybody when we can to be there to rescue them. However, with intractable, complicated and complex crisis, when you put a touch of radicalism or radical Islam, as you can imagine, in many European countries, your average citizen likes to turn off the tally and say, well, you know, they've been at it for, for hundreds of years it won't get solved, let's just go somewhere else, let's give a bit of money to a humanitarian crisis, it'll make me feel good and I absolve myself of the responsibility. But we need to remind, we need to engage, we need to focus, precisely because peace and security in a global world, I mean, it says here somewhere, think globally or lead, think globally, act globally, Problems elsewhere have become global. They're transnational, they will come here too. So even if you want to be very self-serving or self-centered, it's even in Europe's interest to look at a long-term strategy to deal with the problems of the Middle East, not just through the security lens, from a human rights perspective, from a fairness, equity, and equally so, as these are the only profound and solid building blocks for peace and security. Now, where are we as a UN in this regard? There's a lot of talk over time, maybe for decades now, of, of, uh, of the opportunity and the need to make the UN fit for purpose. Maybe like any old sort of international organization, maybe we're not always 
ahead of the curve. Uh, we are also, after all, a product of member states' ability, political will, and financing. However, there's a broad review going on of the United Nations' role in peacekeeping, peace building, and peace engagement. And this is pr precisely because the world around us has changed so much that our own, our old tools, the establishment of large peacekeeping operations, uh, it no longer suffices. There is no point to mount a large operation if you're going to work in an area where actually you're asked to keep the peace, but there is no peace to keep. The actors around you do not want your type of peace. They do not want your type of solution. So we need to think about how we can engage, what type of paradigm risk we are ready to accept, and how we can leverage the strength and influence of regional actors who primarily have to lead on the change. We also need to work around a divided Security Council. Let's hope that we can see a turn of that particular chapter, or rather turn the page in that chapter. We need to also expect more of the Council. You may, you, uh, many of you are, of course, very familiar with uh, um, Valerie Amos, who until very recently was the Emergency Relief Coordinator for the UN. That means she is the senior official of the system in charge of all of the UN's global response to crisis, complex man-made and, and natural man-made crises and natural disasters. She spoke of her frustrations at the Council in her last briefing, particularly with regard to Syria, but also Iraq, speaking to the fact that the, the number of humanitarian resolutions that were passed were not followed through. The Council was unable to impose a decision or require implementation, and if implementation wasn't wholesome or complete, proceed with follow-up action in the way the Council ought to uh, under, its, uh, under its mandate. So the protection of civilians has been failing, has been, uh, uh, has been missing in this entire equation, and this comes back to my point of human rights. At the end of the day, the Charter of the United Nations is about we the people. It is not about we the states, it is we the people, and we're living in a day and age where citizens vote with their feet, they have the choice to become an extremist, they have the, the choice to become a peace activist. And the gray zone, the silent majority in between, still awaits support and assistance by others. Now, what can we do? Uh, there is a growing role, to my mind, for the UN in its good offices and preventive diplomacy, but preventive diplomacy means that you don't come when the crisis has occurred, you come way ahead of time. You have the courage to speak out. We have the courage to flag human rights violations, but also to engage. We also need to look at a more multidimensional approach. As I mentioned before, peacekeeping just with military assets may not be the way to go. We need to invest much more in actual diplomacy, and I hope this is a point well received here. Uh, diplomacy, preventive diplomacy, uh, can avoid significant disasters, but the Council needs to be behind that. We also need to equip ourselves as an international community much more to have a flexible response, anticipating challenges and change. And this is where I'll make the only reference other than questions you may have. The Syria chemical weapons mission, which I led, was an unprecedented effort. If it hadn't been tried before, uh, you do not eliminate a chemical weapons program in a country at war. And actually, no one had done it before. So we were sort of building the plane, flying it, trying to learn how to fly it, and also land the plane with all the passengers, or in this case, the load on board, proverbially. This means risk-taking. It means accepting you are trying, accepting you are most likely to fail, but in the absence of any leadership or normative uh, alternative, you must do it. And this is one way I think all of us need to work more. We've gotten used in the last decades to work on a way that if everybody supports this, meaning there's the lowest common denominator, everybody's behind it, we have consensus, and we might achieve very, very little. Change, transformation, voice, courage, political courage, requires something very different from the lowest common denominator. And this is an era where I think this is needed more than ever before. The radicalization agenda is one perhaps that is a mirror for us as well. Why do people radicalize? It is potentially, partly, also a response to the absence of any other compelling model in town. We need to work at that. We need to provide the alternative, but it needs to be credible and it needs to be matched in follow-up. Principles to engagements, I think, are key. 
Politics is always a dirty game, but for the United Nations, and I think for diplomats as well, it must be about principles, be they conventions, be they the charter, be it also the importance that we attach to the responsibility to protect. There is a framework, and we need to learn to balance how we are prepared to accept the price of our inaction, if you look at Syria, or rather the price of our delayed and staggered responses versus the end result, which may be a divided Syria, but certainly it means a country destroyed. We need to, of course, be mindful of the importance of the sovereign rights of affected countries, but also the rights of refugees and the rights of all the citizens. And in this case, the Secretary General has launched a new framework, which is Human Rights Up Front, which is really trying to promote the human rights agenda as a lens through which we calculate and calibrate all our actions. But we also need to build institutional capacity. A failed state is nothing to future citizens. A failing state is equally weak and in a vacuum, as we've seen in Libya, but also in Iraq and Syria, uh, a lot of things can go dramatically wrong. And the cost of rehabilitation or the, the so-called cure is long, is protracted, and we do not, it will not be linear. There'll be many disappointments on the way. So looking at uh, my last point, the need for Western engagement. There's a natural tension between uh, critical security needs, which we uh, hear a lot of in the West, uh, combating extremists on the border, and universal human rights. To my mind, however, they need to go together and they can go together. So that needs to guide our engagement. It also needs to uh, build our policy, and we look to rebuild a culture and set of institutions in the countries where we seek to work that respect human rights and fundamental human freedoms but also looks towards socio-economic change, prospects, education, health, the basic indicators of well-being and the basic indicators of society and progress in society. Now, looking back, uh, we may be stretched, but I think we have a lot of opportunities because I certainly don't want to sound uh, pessimistic. I think it's complex, the region we work in today, uh, we're looking more and more at partial successes. I, I personally consider the elimination of Syria's chemical weapons program. It should have been an enabler. It should have been a stepping stone to allow the international community to come to the table once this was off the table to have a proper dialogue on the political solution because of political events, security changes, delays and lack of uniformity or lack maybe of a shared vision and direction on the process around Syria, this did not happen. But there's always an opportunity to catch up, there's an opportunity to do much better, and we owe it to the citizens of the region. A safe and secure Middle East is in everyone's interest, but first and foremost, I think it's also our duty, and particularly speaking to the UN. Now, last but not least, uh, democratic society can have many, many different meanings. Um, in different countries, they'll give it different shape, but I think you can measure it on people's ability to thrive, to build the lives the way they want, respect for women and men, respect for diversity, and respect for the status of all the individuals in that society. That is a true, I think, yardstick. A battle can't be won alone, and uh, I, true, I do believe, otherwise I wouldn't be working for the UN, that multilateralism is one of the approaches. It's not the only one. You can work multilaterally in a region. Regions can work across. And more and more we see that solutions within a region can only be carried by the region. And this may be the hope of change in the Syria conflict now that we know that Turkey, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are in dialogue. Iran is invited in Geneva. There are many new opportunities to change. However, I sincerely hope that all those who've lost their lives waiting for the international community and whose lives have been lost or deeply affected can forgive us so we need to really up our game and have the courage of our convictions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Carg will take questions and uh, does not need me, I think, to uh, uh, act in between. So, uh, if you please, can just uh, you say your please... name and where you study or what you study or where yes, you work. Please introduce yourselves if you take... Questions, and I'll leave you to take them. Please. Adam. 
Hinville, and I was a UN correspondent, and I also used to work here. My question is about those chlorine barrel bombs. Uh, the removal of the Category A uh, chemical weapons and chemical materials was a tremendous triumph. But we all knew that they were still using, or somebody was still using, chlorine. Now, please give us a factual assessment of who is using the chlorine and how much is using the chlorine, how much is being used, and how much killing is it doing. Um, well, factual, I'm not sure because I don't think I have the facts. First of all, back to basics, chlorine is not a chemical weapon. It's not doesn't fall under the convention. This has always been the confusion. The use of chlorine, and this is of course the tricky part, the use of chlorine as a chemical weapon is forbidden under the convention. And this is where the violation kicks in. There is, however, never, no one in Syria, or rather Syria as a state party to the chemical weapons convention was under no obligation to declare chlorine because you use it in your hotel, you use it in your swimming pool, it is an important ingredient. It's a chemical product. And I just also want to recall, though I'm not a chemical weapons expert, that a lot of the materials that is required to produce a chemical weapon are actually your very ordinary daily chemical industrial materials. It's the combination which makes it toxic and highly dangerous. That said, there's been a long-standing debate. OPCW, that was not a joint mission, has sent a first fact-finding mission, which proved chlorine was used, but I think that wasn't a surprise. It did not point to culpability as such in its three subsequent reports, which are public and which have been reviewed by the Security Council. Since then, fortunately, at long last, recently a Security Council resolution was passed and there will be follow-up. The number of victims due to chlorine attacks, I am not sure, I do not have them. There are different reports. As you know, the moment an attack has occurred on a city, barrel bombs have been launched, some civil society activists point to smoke, which may be chlorine, yes or no. It's important to document the symptoms and the number of victims. It's critical, 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 that there is follow-up. And I believe now the Security Council is at last behind that. We know that the, where the divide lie, and there'll be follow-up. How easy it is to access the areas where the barrel bombs fall and where the victims are is another matter to document the effects, or rather to be in a position to credibly and scientifically document where the chlorine was used requires fairly timely information. And it's sort of a perishable type of product. I think the, for me, the bottom line is that all violations, all use of weapons against the civilian popu population are a gross violation of human rights, international humanitarian law. It has to stop and it should have stopped years ago. I think this is the fundamental point. There are many ways, sadly, to die in Syria. One of them is by chlorine, but most people have died from conventional weapons, and I think we should, not, we should bear that in mind. There needs to be an end to the maiming and the killing, and the day of accountability needs to come. There should be an end to the impunity, and this is why also I reference the right to protect as a very important framework. You know much more than I do. Well, <laughs> you seem unable to say, and I, I look, uh, I admire your brilliant mastery of UN vocabulary, and I understand and I sense uh, an underlying uh, moral determination of the will. But uh, you are unable, I think, structurally, as a UN official, to say who is dropping the barrel bombs, even though only one side has aircraft. I suspect you are also unwilling, uh, unable, to say who was killed by Sarin, who killed the 1,500 people from Sarin two years ago, a much worse chemical, an undoubted chemical weapon. You cannot say that, uh, and I understand that. You cannot say that because great power and P5 determinations and rivalries restrict very much what the UN can do in this and, and many other areas. And this needs to be remembered, doesn't it, as a corollary, a corrective uh, for all the things you're calling for. Greater engagement, 
smart diplomacy. Who could be against smart diplomacy? But smart diplomacy will only ever be conducted by the UN within the confines of P5 interests. You've said it would be nice if we could turn the page from worsening P5 rivalries, but that doesn't seem very likely, and I suspect you, like anyone else, doesn't have a, a solution to that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm struck by the earnestness and precision of your analysis of what's going wrong, but I'm very skeptical that you have described any way in which we could expect the UN or the international community, if there is an international community, to do any better. Final point, it ain't just the P5. Isn't the problem... It's a question, or not the commentary. Uh, it, it's a question about the plausibility of the di both of the diagnosis and the prescription that we've been hearing. My final point, isn't there a structural problem within, for the UN as well in talking about the kind of states who do the things you don't like? You, you want to move forward on the human rights agenda. But my experience in the UN, and others watching it, much longer and greater than mine, was that the UN is structurally incapable of talking about the failures of the kind of states which have gone so badly wrong in the region. I remember the obsessive concern for the sovereignty and decent, uh, dignity of, of the Iraqi people, which was the formula for protecting the uh, Republican palaces which Saddam had built. That the failure of the post-colonial state, in which I agree that former colonial powers are somewhat bound up in, create, has created a kind of system in the region which the UN is incapable, by its very basis, of criticizing. Every state is wonderful, every state has legitimacy, must be given complete equality in, of respect, even though that's utterly incompatible with the way those, some of those states treat their own people. I mean, aren't these encumbering paradoxes and, and structural difficulties which actually make it very difficult for one to believe in the kind of program you are now proposing? No, I think actually the opposite. Uh, for a simple reason. First of all, I think the UN, uh, let's, make, let's make a difference here, let's, let's be honest, let's make a difference between member states and civil servants. It's a little bit like blaming Brussels for everything and the member states themselves want to walk away from Brussels, some uh, yours or not. Uh, or the citizens. So let's, let's be fair. We're talk let's separate a little bit the civil service from the system that is established by member states and truly cherished by member states for its own reasons. However, I think change is in the offering, is in the make. I think, the, for instance, an example is the open campaign to question the P5 decision making around the appointment of a secretary general. Climate change, another example. If we always accept that it won't happen because it won't happen, we wouldn't have had a uh, all the NGOs that are busy with it. Policy changes can happen by citizens, by public awareness, by advocacy, and the system can do better. I think our reporting on human rights violations in Iraq and Syria have been very clear. The inability, indeed, for the Council to come to a resolution under Chapter 7 to address it is what I'm talking about. But we have the right to protect. There are UN civil servants, all of us, working in Syria at great risk, at great personal risk. We're there. No one else is, not the member states. The member states observe. Secondly, yeah, changes are slow. We have to accept we're in an international system, but the sovereignty debate is much less sacred now than it was maybe the time you remember from UNSCOM. I think that has shifted significantly, partly because a lot of states fail to be sovereign, because borders disappear. And in the Middle East, above all, we're looking to debate, in a way, the disappearance of what was Sykes-Picot, maybe an imperf imperfect um, uh, you know, solution at the time, and now we're dealing with the consequences. So I think the system, member states, civil servants, diplomats are very much struggling, but it doesn't mean we can't come at it. Humanitarian assistance cross-border. We've never had a cross-border resolution to provide humanitarian assistance under Chapter 7. It's imperfect, it's not necessarily happening, but the resolution was passed. The fact that the gap is still very real is another matter. So I, I, it depends on if you look at the, the, cup, the, the glass half full, half empty. Um, um, yeah, no, you, you can do like this, but uh, uh, it's not about the mastery. I think actually we have to, we have to call it. Uh, probably a decade ago, you wouldn't find somebody speaking like me. I actually don't speak a UN vocabulary at all. It's, uh, it's actually quite disappointing if you think I speak a UN vocabulary. I don't think so. Um, I think you wouldn't find many officials 10, 15 years ago coming to a podium. They would come with a prepared speech, not speak to the resolution, they would sort of put, point the finger to either the member states or indeed the sovereignty. That is no longer applies. It is very much about 
who the citizens are, what the charter means, and how we can get there. The fact that it's difficult, that it's imperfect, is another matter. But the what is very clear, the how is fraught with dilemmas. And in that, I think the pace of change around us is so significant that our ability to catch up um, renders and creates new dangers. But your traditional mission, I don't know. And when it comes to, uh, if we can call uh, who is what, unfortunately, no, I can't, but for a very simple reason. I was not part of the first report on, uh, on Eruta. The report was inconclusive. I advise you to speak to the authors. Well, that's, uh, I will leave that to you. Uh, and equally so, there is a follow-up fact-finding mission by OPCW. It's actually quite complex. I understand what you're saying, but I think ultimately, if you look at the destruction of the state of Syria now and where we are, on the scale of things, uh, the, the, the issues are very clear. We, we, we just can't delay by another day what the responses are. Unfortunately, political processes are slow, and they're just as slow amongst the parties, and we need to come to a point where everybody understands that their shared interest is significantly greater because the risks are even greater. Politics is not necessarily clean. I wouldn't put that on the UN. I would put, put that to politics and geopolitical interest. Thank you. Um, such as Hezbollah, um, were now working beyond their borders and going into countries such as Syria and um, were operating there. Uh, but uh, I mean, sources or like what I've been reading in the news recently uh, told me that apparently Hezbollah was fighting ISIS. And I don't know, I, I, I believe that there could be a value in that. And um, you also refer to trying to restrict the influence of Hezbollah into going into these other countries but surely if they are you know, operating in a manner that is detrimental to ISIS's flourishing, then surely that is a value in itself. So I was just wondering if there was actually a value in using these kinds of you know, organizations. Well, no one's using them. Hezbollah has decided uh, on its own, or rather with the, in, in, in consultation, so to speak, to, uh, to engage in Syria. There's a state of Lebanon, there's a government of Lebanon, and the, the government of Lebanon, also the government of the current prime minister, is committed to what is called a policy of disassociation and neutrality. That means non-engagement in the conflict of others, partly because Lebanon has only fairly recently in its history come out of a very protracted and cruel civil war, and its policy of neutrality predates that. Uh, however, uh, Hezbollah uh, has engaged in, in Syria in a, quite an open manner, uh, for uh, reasons of interest that I will, uh, I'll, I will leave you to determine. Um, and its argument is indeed that it is fighting an extremist threat. It has gone there to defend Lebanon. Uh, the Security Council, however, uh, as well as Secretary General and International Support Group for Lebanon, calls on all those who are engaged in Syria to step away from that engagement and to, to it believes, it expressed a strong belief and determination that the stability, security, and territorial integrity of Lebanon can only be shielded by non-engaging in any conflicts beyond Lebanon's border. Lebanon is a mosaic. It's a beautiful country. It has 18 different sects. It is a complex operation to, to run a country of that nature, but it's also still a model of coexistence and diversity, and it's the only model that we currently still have left. So it's very important to shield that. Uh, do you believe that there'll be a role for Bash Bashar al-Assad in um, any future multilateral talks, or is he person non grata? Yeah, I heard it. Um, um, I heard the question. Um, I don't think it's relevant. What I believe, my colleague, and here you'll, you'll get a UN answer, my colleague Stefan is in negotiations and dialogue with all the parties. It's not for me to judge or to speak on. Hi there. Um, Jesu Antonio from International Development Officer with um, International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is affiliated with WHO. Sorry, um, I didn't quite hear your, the organization. The International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology. I'm the International Development Officer, which is affiliated with the WHO. Okay. Um, going back to Lebanon, the Lebanon question, but on a different scope, I work very strongly with, uh, and my organization in general works very strongly with a few partners based in Tripoli, 
which conduct worked in providing ultrasound training to midwives. Predominantly was just for the under uh, disadvantaged Lebanese community, but now it's, it's gone into the Syrian refugee camps. From my understanding from my colleagues there, they have indicated that uh, there has been aggression as time progresses between uh, radicals such as, for example, ISIS-affiliated people and also, of course, the Lebanese um, military engaging and trying to back them up a little bit. Um, my question is, uh, obviously no one wants the, the conflict to spill over into neighboring countries, especially as you've indicated, Lebanon has always been more peace, neutrality, and whatnot. Um, and as you said, it is most definitely a mosaic country and a beautiful one at that. My question is, is there concern within the international community that this would spill in and what particular actions would they be willing to do to make sure that nothing happens to Lebanon, nothing happens to, let's say, the other neighboring countries, as for example, what happened with Iraq and Syria, that's all. Thank you. Uh, you're actually speaking to the heart of a number of the Security Council sessions, which also um, um, my colleague uh, Derek sort of lived through and, 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 and shepherded and, and led on uh, before I came to Lebanon. And actually, the, there are a number of messages and decisions in there. One of them is, as I just mentioned, the policy of disassociation and non-engagement neutrality. Secondly, is to focus on the institutions of state uh, in Lebanon. And a third component is, as an example, to invest in the Lebanese armed forces. So to only act and support and accelerate support to the Lebanese armed forces to indeed to be the ones to shield Lebanon, to protect, to deal with issues of extremist in-country, but also to shield the borders. When it comes, of course, to the blue line, the, the line of, of disengagement between Israel and, and, and Lebanon, in this case, South Lebanon, we rely very much on the role of UNIFIL. Uh, to work with the LAF. So these are very practical examples. And last but not least, given the fact that Lebanon has over one, one third of its current residents are Syrian refugees uh, who, live, who don't live in camps. There are no such thing as camps because the Lebanese did not want what they themselves call want to repeat the Palestinian experience. These are informal settlements and the majority of, Le of Syrians are scattered across. I mean, they're in areas, but they live in informal dwellings, initially with relatives, uh, low, low cost housing, etc. To help Lebanon cope with the stay, not just the influx, but the stay of 1.2 million registered refugees. Schooling, health services, it's weighing heavily on an already very poor and underinvested infrastructure. So there are two things here, to help deal with the consequences, but also make sure that the Syrian refugees are not marginalized further than they already are, and to look at ways of looking after their rights. It's fragile. So you're looking at humanitarian assistance, at development assistance for the Lebanese poor, because we should not forget it's not all glitz. And, you know, there's life outside Beirut, or within Beirut we have very poor areas, unemployment rates are very high, but also looking at the security dimension to work with the institutions of state that is critical. Without that, you will not have a state. You just point to um, My name is Walker, Sorry. former British diplomat. I have five different kinds of questions. Um, some years ago, not many years ago, the UN Security Council, if I'm right, passed a resolution to the effect that there should be a greater role for women in peacekeeping and post-conflict resolution. Can you, as a matter of interest, say whether you've observed any practical effects since that resolution was passed? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You're talking about Security Council Resolution 1325, and we've recently celebrated, I believe, a decade, or rather marked the decade of 1325. Uh, in a number of conflict situations, there is greater attention to the role of women either in dialogue, in peace building, and in their role as leaders of their communities. So basically make women, empower them to be part of the solution at local level, national level. That can mean in elections. I mean, Rwanda was one example. Actually, Rwanda is a shining example of female representation in parliament, but there are many other countries. Work with women community leaders, but also at the national level, as I mentioned, uh, on issues of corruption, governance, but also women's rights. So to review legislation, a lot has happened, but we have a long way to go. And the last point is uh, women in leadership positions in peacekeeping or peace building operations. Still not enough. We're, we're only 20%, and I'm the only one in the region. So, uh, but that, that's not the issue. It's about women, women in the countries, conflict-affected countries. 
um, a long way to go. Now, a last question, actually, it's interesting, so you triggered something. It's about war as a, a rape as a weapon of war. And I think Security Council Resolution 1325, in a way, is also pointing to that. Since then, of course, as we've seen in Iraq, but also other countries, sexual exploitation of women and the threat of sexual exploitation, the dishonoring of women and therefore rendering their return, if returned at all, to their family, almost impossible. The shame factor is so big that a lot more psychosocial trauma counseling needs to be prioritized and support for women uh, to deal with these situations needs, needs to be seen almost as a peace and security tool. It cannot just be left for the social welfare pocket. It's about you know, the primacy of human dignity. And I think we've come to realize that much more sadly because of the incidents, the reporting, but also the availability of information. The only good thing in this entire tragedy, I think, is as sadly the numbers of victims, the number of women that have fallen victim to such practice is so significant for me, let's say the girls abducted by Boko Haram or in Iraq, the Yazidi women, it's so significant, everybody realizes this is not an exception. And entire communities need to be prepared to, to deal with this. And that requires a lot. And I think that's also at the heart of 1325. But we cannot separate security as a sort of a military component. All these are part, I think, of a new response. Um, I was working in uh, the UNDP office in Jerusalem in 2006, January, when Hamas won the elections. And uh, you had mentioned something that uh, one of the uh, positive things about the United Nations is the ability to speak to different groups, except for those on the terrorist list. So don't you think it's time that this terrorist list is put aside so that the UN can actually speak to the increased number of non-state actors that you also mentioned that are playing a much larger role in order to at least begin to build bridges for future reconciliation in years to come? And is that list, um, I mean, when, when is it time for that list to be put aside and the UN to actually be able to speak to different groups? Thank you. I think, uh, thank you. In, uh, in process terms, the list is, uh, you know, subject to constant review. Now, that doesn't mean you get reviewed, doesn't mean you get taken off it. Uh, however, uh, since 2006, the special, special coordinator for the Middle East peace process has maintained dialogue and contacts with Hamas, for instance. So in your time, I know that wasn't necessarily possible, but since then, there's been an evolution. Uh, same as we've always maintained contacts with Hezbollah in, in different levels. And it's very important, I think, uh, precisely because uh, you, you tend to not be able, you, you know, you can facilitate contacts with your friends very easily. It's the ones you need to sort of bring a, a bridge, bridge with that is more relevant. However, um, ISIS is on the list, um, I believe also Jabhat Nusra. So I think the review has to be very precise and has to be real, and we have to know what we're looking at. The violations that are on lists are very, very important, and the Security Council, I think, has criteria and parameters, but I think we need to assess that all the time. But I think the, 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 the situations we're dealing with then and now are quite different, and the actors on the stage, the extremist elements, uh, some of them, are obviously also of a, of, a, of a different batting order. I'm not comparing A, B, and C. I'm just saying that there are contacts with Hamas. And at, uh, for humanitarian access, of course, you have the humanitarian country team that will always try to reach out to everybody, same as ICRC or NGOs. They will risk and go, go a long way to make sure that those who need food, who need assistance, medical support, will have access to that. It's very important that the humanitarian community, be they local or international, that they continue to be able to sort of work on what is called, as you know, the humanitarian imperative. At the end of the day, that goes beyond everything. And that this is also not clouded under the political umbrella. And that's been very hard, I think, also in the last decade. The political field, the sort of the politicization of humanitarian assistance, and we've seen that in Syria too, which is why these resolutions were passed a government that actually restricts, doesn't give access, doesn't issue permits, doesn't issue visas, and, and, and. Whereas it's the Syrian citizens that suffer. So we need to continue to push that. And Valerie Amos has done a brilliant job, and I hope her successor will do as well, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Guthrie, and, and I am a chemical weapons, uh, and chemical and biological weapons specialist. Um, but I, I want a question that's a bit more general than that. I mean, hopefully Syria will be a, 
a one-off, uh, an experience we, we can put behind us eventually, and hopefully we'll, there won't be any similar cases. However, there are still half a dozen countries outside of the Chemical Weapons Convention, some of which we might be quite concerned with about currently having um, certain types of weapons, such as North Korea, uh, some that historically have used them in the past, such as Egypt. In terms of lessons learned, is there any of the skills or expertise or resources that have been developed during the Syria situation uh, that should be retained for future cases? And, and indeed, is there anything that was, was lacking in the uh, start of the uh, Syria operation um, that you would have liked to have had that would be useful for any similar operations in the future? Um, no. I actually think um, we, we started with the premise that uh, failure was not an option and, and truly meaning it. We didn't have a choice. We had a deadline. Uh, and so we had a date d'échéance as well, that things would change dramatically. I think we were blessed. Uh, we worked hard for it to maintain it, to have actual unity of the Security Council. This was the sole topic on which, in a very critical time, Ukraine was about to happen and then the situation deteriorated further. The Security Council agreed that this needed to be implemented. And it, it speaks to the, to the significant powers on, on the team. The Russians and the Americans agreed to this. Syria became a state party. But that was about it. We had a declaration. We sort of had a list. Not a game plan, not an implementation ability. A country at war. Um, ISIS proliferating itself, Jabhat Nusra, other groups. No access to some of the sites where chemical weapons material was stored and also uh, no way to know how you're going to destroy the material. Because normally, as you know, you destroy it in country and the state party is responsible. So I think it's incomparable. I sincerely hope it will remain unprecedented for one reason, that chemical weapons are best destroyed in peacetime. That's the OPCW and Chemical Weapons Convention recipe. If in another situation it is to be destroyed by the international community or in, with a lead role uh, under a Chapter 7 resolution, it means that we've really already hit a very dangerous situation. So there are many lessons learned in terms of international response, negotiations, mobility, access to technology, finance. We weren't short of it. It was almost embarrassing um, compared to the humanitarian needs. Political will, we worked that, but we maintained it. And then dealing with the cynics and the media. So there's a lot of hype out there, a lot of speculation, a lot of invention. At the end of the day, the proof of the pudding was at least in what we know we've achieved. But to suggest that chemical non-proliferation of chemical weapons, in this case, is the major factor for peace and security, no. Non-proliferation is important in and of its own right. It's a norm. There's an international standard. So it's important regardless. But the moment the situation changes, uh, I, I think biological weapons is of serious concern. Because people have access to it a lot more than states do. Okay, well, um, I hope you will all come and join us upstairs for our reception. And you'll be able to stay with us a little longer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to thank you, uh, Carl, for spending time with us this evening. I think it's been a model of uh, engagement, if I may say so, uh, and not resorting to uh, formulae and speeches, um, which I hopefully other officials can uh, uh, copy um, in the future. And I want personally to thank you for uh, your exemplary leadership. And if uh, our students go on to uh, do half as much as you had, I think the world will be in a considerably better shape. Thank you very much. Indeed.